since the subcommittee's last oversight hearing on WMATA, the events of the past month have obviously necessitated the need for this panel to reassess and explore a host of issues relating to WMATA's services and operations, which are indispensable uh, to the region and to the federal government. While today's hearing certainly won't bring a final resolution as to the cause or leading factors of the recent accident, given the various ongoing investigations, the hearing is meant to continue the dialogue between WMATA and its regional partners and the various federal government oversight entities on the specific issue of system safety and to learn what is being done now to prevent, as best as possible, another fatal accident from occurring in the future. I'd like to thank today's witnesses for joining us as we discuss this important matter. I look forward to your testimony. And I now yield to our ranking member, Jason Chaffetz, the gentleman from Utah, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lynch. I, I appreciate you uh, holding this uh, hearing and uh, participation today. On April 29th, we held an oversight hearing on the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. At that hearing, we examined Metro's financial condition and internal controls, along with safety and security issues. On June 22, 2009, a tragic, ac tragic accident, the most serious in Metro's history, occurred on the red line. One train crashed in the back of another, killing nine and injuring 80. In addition to the dead and injured, damage to the morale of Metro's riders and its workers, and to the Metro's reputation as a whole, is ongoing. A recent Washington Post editorial commented on the crash as having, quote, shattered many riders' assumptions about the safety of the system, end quote. Today's oversight hearing will examine that accident and continuing challenges faced by Metro. Metro appears to be in the throes of an epic crisis. As a member of Congress and as a Metro user myself, I'm, I'm very concerned about the direction. Even in, before the catastrophe of June 22nd, a Washington Post story described comments from the Metro riders as revealing, quote, a band of beaten down and frustrated people who, despite their close kinship with Metro, have had about enough, end quote. In the wake of June 22nd, the June 22nd crash, a more recent story reflected growing concerns about extensively cramped conditions, uh, uh, long commutes, jerky rides, abrupt stops, and passengers waiting for more than three full trains to pass before boarding. There is also evidence of nerves rubbed raw and some reports of yelling and shoving along the way. While investigations are continuing, there are deeply disturbing reports of track circuit problems which should have been anticipated and which have been dealt with in other systems, notably the Bay Area Rapid Transit System in San Francisco. Metro apparently never installed a backup system that is used by BART. A significant segment of the federal workforce relies on the Metro, plus millions of visitors each year. We are also quite aware of the enhanced security issues which apply to the Metro because it services the Washington region. The last Congress approved a measure sponsored by the former chairman of our committee, Tom Davis, who I am pleased to see as one of our witnesses today. That law authorizes much-needed funds and mandates man management assistance but follow through by the administration of this Congress is re required to make that law a reality. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses today and let me just say on a personal note, a heartfelt uh, thoughts and prayers with those who were injured and killed uh, on the Metro. Uh, it's devastating any time you see that. Uh, I think that's the importance of the hearing today. I look forward to the participation here. We want to make sure that we're implementing the best practices. I think it individually is break it up. Everybody's heart's in the right direction. But if the management's not there to coordinate and move, the, move it forward in a cohesive matter, I think that's where this committee needs to be involved. I, I have my, my Metro card. I like writing it. I enjoy it. But there are also challenges. There are times and things and frustrations that I think are appropriate for us to dive into. And so, Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you for uh, holding this hearing. I look forward to the dialogue from hearing from our witnesses and uh, better understanding what's happening or what's not happening with the Metro today. And with that, I'll yield back. I thank the gentleman. Before we continue with opening statements, I would invite our first panel to come forward and be seated. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, uh, Ms. Holmes Norton, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to once again thank Chairman Stephen Lynch for his attention to Metro by responding to my request early in his tenure as the new chair of this subcommittee with a hearing on April 24th and again today granting my request for this hearing in light of the June 22nd Metro tragedy. I had spoken with the appropriate Metro and National Transportation Safety Board officials 
concerning this hearing before the investigation is completed and learned that it is not unusual to be asked to testify before an investigation is, is fully completed. The investigation of this collision may require well in excess of a year or even more. Following our hearing in April, we had every reason to believe that the Metro system was a safe system and because of the consistent oversight of this subcommittee, I continue to believe that the system that serves this region and millions of visitors is safe. I would not hesitate to board a Metro train even after the tragedy of June 22nd. However, the public is not fully aware of what this subcommittee has learned during years of consistent oversight about the overall safety of the system, and in any case, the public deserves to know much more about this recent catastrophe. It is fair for riders to seek reassurance now or to know whether there is reason to be concerned about the daily trip on a metro train. The public has bits and pieces of information about what may have caused the accident and what is being done now to assure its safety. Today's hearing, however, will make public all that is known now as Congress opens its own investigation and will allow the public to separate urban legend from authoritative facts and eyewitness testimony. Long before the June 22nd accident, the regional congressional delegation had been working to secure funds for Metro for capital costs, such as replacement of uh, Metro trains, burdened by increasing numbers of federal and congressional employees, among others, actually subsidized by the federal government uh, in order to encourage employees uh, to take Metro, who form the majority of Metro's weekday employees. Today, the region is particularly grateful to Transportation House uh, Urban Development uh, uh, Appropriations Chair, John Oliver, for finding the funds in his appropriation for the first $150 million installment in the $1.5 billion Congress authorized for a 10-year period. Regrettably, despite our efforts over several years, funding was not authorized until 2008 when control changed in the Congress. But we particularly appreciate the efforts of the former chair of the full committee, uh, Tom Davis, who started us down the road to today's funding and we are happy to have testify today. The funds, the necessary funds also, were not included in the president's budget, despite constant urging from the regional delegation. But Chairman Oliver found the funds to meet this year's commitment. And I know that millions of public and private employees and residents are deeply grateful to him and to the subcommittee. I have just come, Mr. Chairman, for managing a floor resolution, recognizing those who were injured, and remembering residents we lost in this tragedy. Seven from the District of Columbia, one from Maryland, and another from Virginia. We do not have a response that can console the losses of the victims and their families and those who were injured. However, we can begin with today's hearing and the first appropriation for Metro under our bill to demonstrate to all the families, friends, and associates, and to current riders that this tragedy has already had immediate effects for assuring the safety of our transportation system. May I thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for your consistent attention to this system. I thank the gentlelady. I would now like to ask unanimous consent to allow uh, Mr. Micah from Florida, 
who I am told was the past chairman of this uh, subcommittee, to allow him to join the panel and in today's discussion as well. Uh, hearing no objections, so ordered. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to recognize Mr. Micah from Florida for five minutes. Well, thank you, and thank you uh, for yielding. And uh, while I'm on the full committee, I'm no longer a member of the subcommittee. Uh, and uh, pleased to be here uh, to discuss an important to topic. I also am the Republican ranking member of the trans full Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Uh, Ms. Norton and I also serve on uh, that uh, committee together. Uh, in that capacity, I did want to make some remarks. And first of all, I want to join others in expressing our sympathy to those that lost loved ones in the, the tragedy of the Metro uh, crash. Uh, we don't know all of the details. I know NTSB is investigating. But again, our heartfelt sympathy to those uh, who lost loved ones and uh, or had uh, uh, family members injured in that uh, tragedy. And it is our, our important responsibility of this subcommittee, the uh, investigative committee of Congress, and I applaud you for, uh, for holding this uh, hearing. I think it's very important, not just the Transportation Committee, but our investigative committee uh, take uh, action like you're doing here today. Uh, it has been reported that the automatic train control system failed to detect a, a, a train waiting on the tracks. Um, if the system had been working properly, uh, possibly, uh, again, the, the, the crash could have been avoided. NTSB will uh, really investigate the crash and let us know. However, we do know that other transit systems around the country rely on automatic train control systems, including San Francisco, Boston, Baltimore, Atlanta, Philadelphia, and, uh, and my state, Miami. Last year, uh, Congress and we, a lot of us worked on it together. We passed an Amtrak uh, rail passenger rail safety bill. And in that legislation, Congress required that within the next six years, commuter uh, rail trains, inner city passenger trains, and freight trains carrying hazardous materials install similar positive train control systems. Uh, uh, there, we have to learn lessons uh, from uh, tragedies like the one we've experienced uh, here in the Washington community for rail safety around the country. Um, I, I do want to note for the record that three years ago the Highway and Transit Subcommittee held an oversight hearing on transit safety. And at that hearing, the Government Accountability Office made a number of findings and argued for more, uh, a more robust uh, safety oversight program. Unlike aviation uh, railroads, including commuter railroads, transit safety oversight is handled uh, at the local level by uh, state safety oversight agencies. This is because the Federal Transit Administration is a grant-making uh, agency. It's not a regulatory uh, body. Uh, each ra rail uh, transit system is different and has unique system specifications. The transit agency develops a system a, a system safety plan for each transit system and the state safety oversight agency directly oversees the safety of the transit system by reviewing safety plans, performing audits, and investigating accidents. Uh, some of you may not know this, but uh, FTA currently does not uh, per, uh, permit expenditure of funds to support those uh, uh, safety offices and officers uh, who have that responsibility. I'm sending, and I'm going to have uh, uh, some members have already joined me in sending this letter to the FTA administrator today, and it's as follows. Let me uh, paraphrase it here. We understand that the Federal Transit uh, Administration uh, administrative policy prohibits transit agencies from using their federal grant dollars to support expenses of the state safety offices that directly oversee the safety of uh, transit systems. Uh, again, according to a, a GAO report from our committee, these state safety offices are often inadequately funded and staffed. I think in Washington Metro up to about a year ago, they had about one position, now they have two. And again, they're prohibited from taking federal, these federal dollars, and it's not by law, it's by policy. However, given uh, what occurred last year with the, uh, in, uh, I guess, the Boston Green Line and also with the Washington Metro system recently, 
uh, we feel it's important that these safety offices be strengthened. So we recommend in this letter here that the Federal Transit Administration work with us to provide those agencies, uh, again, uh, the flexibility to utilize some of the dollars, uh, maybe a small percentage, for some of these important positions. So I'll be asking other members to sign this and send this. And I think that uh, the, the final concern that I have here, members, is that Mr. Oberstar and I have been trying to get a major highway and transit bill passed. The current one we operate under expires in just a few months at the end of, uh, of September. The administration's now said that, uh, in the process, that while we're in the process of drafting this, they sort of dropped a bomb on us and said, let's extend this for 18 months. What will happen is all of these safety projects, all of our transportation projects, our major transit projects, and major highway and infrastructure projects will be hold, put on hold for two years. And if we wanted to mandate uh, changes by law, we would uh, have a, a tough time doing it. So I urge everyone to work with Mr. Oberstar and myself to try to move that legislation forward. Urge members to sign this letter because we don't need legislation to get FTA to do uh, what they should be doing is allowing more flexibility and use of, of these fu federal funds for safety oversight purposes. Thank you so much for the courtesy extended me, Mr. Chairman. Would the gentleman like to have the letter entered into the record? I would and uh, appreciate it. And I will um, also ask other members to sign. We've okay. got some signatures here. Thank you so much. I okay. Unanimous consent. Okay. I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman's letter be entered into the record without objection so ordered. Uh, the chair now recognizes the, the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I ask unanimous consent that my full opening statement be placed in the record. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're honored today, to, as, uh, uh, as Congresswoman Norton said, to have uh, Mr. Davis here. Mr. Davis, when he was Chairman Davis, championed the metro system and continued to do so until his departure last year. If, you, if, uh, if as I will predict, Congressman Davis would rightfully so say, if you can't get it right in D.C., you can't get it right in public train around the country. There's a proposal in the stimulus package uh, just passed a few months ago to put a mag lift uh, type of train, a high-speed 200-mile-an-hour train between Orange County and Las Vegas. It's pretty clear that we have fundamental problems with going 59 miles an hour with absolute safety in Washington, D.C. Uh, here today we're going to hear about how the accident happened, how it won't happen again, but more importantly, I think this is an opportunity for us to look at a 30-plus-year-old uh, system since 1973 when the whole metro system began being rolled together and say, have we done all that we can do? I know that Chairman Davis did all he could do on his watch, but I do believe that Washington, D.C., a compact city with a large ridership that comes into federal uh, systems or in and around the city every day, commuters who buy both their own choice and by incentives from the federal uh, government, essentially in most cases free passes, want to use this system and want it to be 100 percent safe and 100 percent reliable. Mr. Chairman, I believe that uh, we as a committee have a special obligation to look at this system, but I believe that what we get right in this system, including the full funding of all the safety requirements, in fact, is essential for all systems around the country. And I, like many people, everyone has a solution when they come after a tragedy like this. I might strongly suggest to this committee that we bear in mind that there are billions of unspent stimulus dollars that are, in fact, earmarked for train transportation that will not be spent in the near future and might very well still be redirectable to meet the needs of getting the metro system both safe and reliable at the level that we believed we were at and believe we should be at. I look forward to hearing our panel, and I thank the chairman for holding this important hearing and yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, before we swear our witnesses, I want to ask if Mr. Tewitt uh, is here. Uh, come forward. Um, Mr. Tewitt was an eyewitness uh, on the day of the, the accident. Uh, we will entertain him when he does arrive. Uh, it is the custom in this subcommittee to swear witnesses who are 
uh, to testify. May I ask you all to stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear uh, that your testimony before this subcommittee here today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that all of the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. With the absence of Mr. Tewitt, who will be sworn when he arrives, uh, and your entire statement will be included in the record. Uh, Mr. Davis, I'm sure you don't need to be instructed in this matter, but uh, the green light indicates that uh, each witness has five minutes to summarize your statement. The yellow light means you have one minute remaining to complete your statement, and the red light indicates that your time for speaking has expired. Uh, I'd like to, uh, originally I, I had offered the courtesy to Mr. Conley to introduce uh, Mr. Davis, uh, and here he is. Perfect. Jerry, you're just a little late. We were just about to give he your seat right, away. Gentleman is right on time, as always. Uh, the chair would now like to recognize the gentleman from Northern Virginia, Mr. Conley, for the purposes of introducing uh, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, as ever, for your graciousness. Um, it's a great privilege for me to sit up here and welcome back to this committee our distinguished former chairman, Tom Davis. Uh, Tom Davis uh, and I have followed in each other's footsteps. He was a longtime member of the Board of Supervisors of Fairfax County, then became the chairman of Fairfax County, and then took this congressional seat. I also was a longtime member of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, succeeded Tom as chairman, and then, of course, succeeded him in this seat. Tom has been a friend and a mentor. He has shown uh, bipartisan inclinations that are deeply appreciated. And I want to say personally, in my transition to this job, uh, Tom Davis could not have been more gracious and more generous, he and his staff. And I just want to thank him and thank him for his leadership in Metro. Without Tom's vision, uh, this Congress would never have come up with the idea of a $150 million matching grant to the localities putting up capital money for Metro. As the tragedy of June 22nd underscored, um, Metro is starved for capital investment. And, and the federal government bears some responsibility, as do the localities, uh, in trying to address that investment uh, shortage. And again, I salute my predecessor, Tom Davis, for his understanding of that issue, his vision for what had to be done, and his willingness to make sure that this Congress lived up to that obligation. Welcome back, Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Representative Connolly, and your continued uh, commitment to public service. Uh, for a lot of battles, usually together, not always, as uh, local politics go. Chairman Lynch, thank you for calling this hearing. It's, uh, it's, it's timely. Uh, it's important. Uh, let me thank uh, Mrs. Norton, Mr. Issa, who helped us pass this legislation uh, first in 06 and then in 08 when we finally got it to the Senate and uh, into law. And uh, the ranking member, it's, uh, it's nice to see you again. And thank you for your leadership as well. Um, we saw early on with GAO reports that the Metro has a $6 billion shortfall in terms of its capital funding need. And there was no way that this could have been raised within the existing system. Fares would not have supported it. So the legislation simply bid off part of that, $3 billion, um, $1.5 billion paid for by the federal government in uh, over 10 years, one point five in matching funds, dedicated matching funds from localities. Prior to the legislation, there was no dedicated funding. Metro got what it got on an annual basis. And when local governments cut their budget, Metro suffered as a result. This has put, I think, a needed discipline on local governments to get the match. And I was just thrilled to hear the Chairman Oliver put in the $150 million, uh, last night in the Transportation Appropriation Bill. This is a, a precedent for the next 10 years that I think will go a long way uh, toward uh, making the Metro system uh, safer and uh, stronger. Uh, I also want to offer my condolences to the friends and the families of the nine Metro passengers who tragically lost in last month's crash. Uh, and for their injury, for those that are injured, I wish them a speedy recovery. Um, you know, as policymakers, like it or not, we bear some responsibility uh, in funding and some of the shortfalls the system has had over time. Uh, and I think, if anything else, we want to learn from this. We don't want this to happen again. So. Let me go briefly over what the legislation called for and what remains to be done and how we can continue to make this a safer and a better system here in the nation's subway system. Um, first of all, the Congress last night put in $150 million for the fiscal year. The localities have already come up with their match. 
uh, an independent IG was established under the legislation so that Metro it's, wouldn't be looking at itself. You'd have an independent inspector general, which we think helps their operations and keeps them on their toes, something that I think was overdue. Metro actually, we introduced the legislation. Metro actually acted uh, on their own to establish this, but the legislation uh, mandates it. Finally, federal representation on the Metro Board it was an important concept, and that has not taken place yet. It hasn't taken place because Congress has not adopted the changes to the Metro Compact. Uh, Representative Hoyer has pending legislation that will do that. All three of the states have amended the Metro Compact through their state legislatures and city councils. Now the federal government has to do that, I think, the quicker the possible so that the uh, president can appoint two federal members to the Metro Board. Now, why is this important? It's important because... Uh, although Virginia and Maryland in the district have representatives on the s subway system, uh, the, the natural tendency, and I've been in local government for 15 years before I came here, is to be rather provincial in terms of how you look at the system. Is it good for Maryland? Is it good for Virginia? Is it good for stations in my district? Uh, having that federal representation on there, that federal expertise, I think will add uh, a level, if you will, of maturity and a, a, a level of um, analysis that I think will be helpful to this system. The President's got to make good appointees, but I think if you, I, I think we can count on them to do that. So that has to happen uh, as well. The legislation also uh, expanded wireless service on the metro system. Prior to this, it was reserved for one operator. This uh, expands it. We think this is helpful, particularly in cases of, uh, of uh, accidents and, and crime. Um, finally, let me say that I think the NTSB has identified uh, some improvements that need to be worked on immediately uh, this, through the signaling system, uh, monitoring and tracking systems. Uh, I think there is stimulus money available. It would be helpful if, if the Congress pushed to get a slug of money up there, right there, to make these changes right away so that the kind of tragedy that happened on uh, June 22nd uh, will not happen again and we can make those changes. Other than that, I want to th thank the members up here in the House uh, for being so supportive of Metro over the years. Uh, it was the Senate that held the legislation up for, for four years, and, and uh, you all have been great to work with. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. And, and I want to add uh, to Mr. Connolly's remarks about uh, uh, you, Mr. Davis, and how, as chairman of this committee, you, you were very fair and bipartisan and uh, provided a great example, uh, I, I think, of uh, strong leadership in the Congress during your time here. Uh, at this point, I would like to uh, introduce Ms. Jackie Jeter, she is the president of the Amalgamated Transit Union Local 689. Uh, Ms. Jeter began her career with the Transit Authority as a part-time bus operator in 1979 and has worked as a full-time bus operator, train operator, and interlocking operator. Ms. Jeter is a member of today's Women's Caucus of Local 689 and has the distinction of being the first female assistant business agent of Local 689. And I also want to express my uh, heartfelt sympathies for uh, you and your members. I know you lost uh, a valued member of your local union, Local 689, and Janice McWill McMillan uh, on the day of this accident, and we understand that her, her conduct uh, at the time of this accident in, in slowing the train down uh, may have saved lives in terms of her own action here. Uh, but again, we, we thank you for your attendance here, and uh, you are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, it is my honor to serve as a witness before you today. As a rail operator of 22 years and as president of the Amalgamated Transit Union, Local 689, I am deeply and personally affected by the tragic WMATA rail accident of June 22nd. I join my union members and others to urge swift, corrective actions. We stand ready to help find solutions that uh, improve and improvements and technological advancements capable of addressing the problems of the aging WMATA rail system. I firmly believe that we cannot afford to spend time on expensive studies and multiple meetings, but must instead move into implementation mode without further delay. When the National Transportation Safety Board's report from its investigation into the June 22nd accident is in hand, we will have a much better idea of what went wrong and how to resolve those problems. I urge the committee to be cautious about drawing any conclusion fr conclusions from this hearing. 
I believe that it would be premature to publicly conjecture about the causes of the crash. I also call on WMATA and the NTSB to be transparent in their investigation for the sake of the workers, the public, and policymakers. Local 689's motto is we make it work. Janice McMillan, the operator killed in the crash, embodied that spirit. Her actions epitomized the heroism sometimes required of our members. Safety is the number one priority of Local 689. It is what we work hard to deliver every day to every rider on the buses and trains. As president of the Workers' Union one, Union, one of my primary goals is to ensure that every worker receives appropriate safety measures and training from WMATA. While we do not yet know the exact causes of the accident, there were troubling patterns of WMATA's responses to previous NTSB recommendations. Since the first fa fatal accident on WMATA in 1982, the NTSB has, has recommended installing carborne monitors in every WMATA car to provide advanced performance data for every department. None of the 1,000 series cars in the systems are so equipped, including those involved in the accident. After the 1996 Shady Grove accident, the NTSB recommended WMATA, WMATA evaluate all series of Metro Rail cars with respect to resisting car body telescoping and providing better passenger protection and make, it, make the necessary modifications. After the 2004 Woodley Park accident, the NTSB made a specific recommendation to either retire or retrofit the Roar built 1,000 series cars based on their crash worthiness. WMATA again failed to comply with these recommendations, citing costs and binding lease agreements through 2014. The NTSB made an urgent recommendation to include specific instructions when responding to rollback situations, and WMATA responded that it would not address the issue. The recommendation was left as open, unacceptable response in the NTSB reports. It is unfortunate that the NTSB can do little more than make recommendations based on these findings. It has no power as an agency to enforce any of its own suggestions. Furthermore, there are, is no independent body to oversight with oversight of WMATA other than Congress. Over the years, Local 689's leadership has continually made suggestions to WMATA for procedural and equipment changes. WMATA is allowed to choose, ignore, defer recommendations until it deems the time ripe for implementation. Safety should not fall victim to fiscal constraints or internal priorities. Any legislation for the WMATA system should include regulations, enforcement, and oversight. WMATA is heavily constrained by its funding, and I see that my time is running out, and I believe that funding is important for WMATA. We need dollars. It's an aging infrastructure, and in order to make that infrastructure work for the members of Local 689 and all of the employees of WMATA, we have to put the money where this nation wants it. If public transportation is something that we need, and we sorely need it, uh, based on the economy itself, we've, it's been proven that tr public transportation is needed, then we need to put the dollars where it is needed. And I thank you so much for this opportunity. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, our next witness is Mr. William Millar, who joined the American Public Transportation Association in 1996 and has worked to increase federal investments in public transportation. From 1973 to 1977, Mr. Millar worked for the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, where he created Pennsylvania's free transit program for senior citizens. Mr. Millar also spent 13 years as the executive director at the Port Authority of Allegheny County. Uh, Mr. Millar, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, let me thank uh, you for uh, holding these hearings today and my uh, uh, appreciate very much the opportunity to be here on behalf of the public transportation uh, industry. You know, when a terrible tragedy such as the one that is the subject of this hearing uh, occurs, all of us uh, certainly feel uh, a great loss. We feel uh, certainly great sympathy and our prayers and our sympathies go out uh, to the victims, to their families, to their loved ones. 
uh, it is a tragedy uh, like this that causes us to take a step back, to examine what we do, to see how we might improve the way we do things uh, in order to uh, prevent these types uh, of, uh, of accidents from happening. Uh, as others have already said, we do not yet know the exact causes, but that shouldn't stop us from taking prudent steps uh, to move forward. And I know later in this hearing you'll hear testimony from Ramada and others about steps that are being taken. Our association stands ready to support WMATA, this committee, and any other bodies uh, involved here in uh, trying to make our systems safer. Now, notwithstanding the terrible tragedy we're discussing today, Americans are using public transportation in modern record numbers. There are many reasons why Americans are using public transit, but there's one undeniable common thread. Tens of millions of customers rely on public transportation every day because our systems are fundamentally safe. But as this terrible tragedy demonstrates, they can always and must be made safer. Years of proven performance records have instilled a confidence in the riding public that our systems will transport them safely. I continue to use Metrorail for my commute on a daily basis because it is a safe system and because the alternatives are much less safe. The U.S. Department of Transportation data shows that a person is 20 ti 29 times safer when using heavy rail public transportation such as WMATA operates rather than taking the same trip in an automobile. Further, the congressionally created National Surface Transportation Revenue and Policy Study Commission indicated that highway travel accounts for over 94% of all fatalities and then 99% of all injuries on the nation's surface transportation system. This data clearly uh, indicates that the public's trust in public transportation is not misplaced. Public transit is uh, one of the safest modes of transportation available. But numbers and statistics aside, nothing is infallible. Therefore, APTA and its members remain vigilant in continuing our commitment to advancing uh, transit safety and promoting the safe operation of rail transit systems. Now, I've been asked to comment on several areas by the committee regarding uh, safety standards and procedures in the industry. Please note I'm not speaking of WMATA specifically, but rather presenting information generally about the industry, much of which would be applicable to WMATA. For decades, we've been the leading force in developing safety programs and standards for public transportation operations, maintenance, and procurement. In the 1980s, APTA was asked by the rail transit industry and FTA's predecessor, the Urban Mass Transportation Administration, to develop a standardized program for rail transit safety, which we established under the auspices of what was then known as the Rail Safety Review Board. APTA's commitment to safety was also the basis for our standards development program initiated in 1996, which currently includes standards for rail transit, commuter rail, bus operations, procurement, intelligent communications interface, and security. Our organization has been designated as a standards development organization, shorthand SDO, uh, by the U.S. Department of Transportation and is funded in part through grants from the Federal Transit Administration. Congress has also officially recognized the importance of promoting voluntary industry-based standards as a way of creating uniformity within the legal and regulatory structure of the United States. My written testimony contains a much more detail on the nature of these standards, the process that is used, and things of that sort. I do think it's important to realize we don't rely just on our own members or our own expertise. We involve uh, many other organizations, such as the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, the American Railway Engineering and Maintenance Association, and a host of others, as well as working with the Federal Transit Administration, the Federal Railroad Administration, the National Transportation Safety Board, and others in developing these standards. To date, we've published over 170 rail standards in categories applicable to heavy rail transit, uh, and such as those used by WMATA. Uh, heavy rail crash worthiness standard developed by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers in collaboration with APTA is a good example, developed after some five years of, present, of work uh, at the professional level. Now, there's much more in my written uh, comments. I appreciate I've exhausted my time here. 
and I would certainly look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you, sir. I thank the gentleman. I now yield myself uh, five minutes. Uh, let, me, let me just say that I know there are four or five uh, federal agencies that have shared responsibility here, and uh, this has, a, has resulted in, in, a, in an inordinate amount of uh, acronyms being used at this uh, <laughs> hearing. So I would just caution people to at least, before you use the acronym, just describe the full title of whatever that is uh, you're referring to. And for those uh, uh, listening or, or watching at home, uh, WMATA stands for Washington Metro Area Transit Authority. And so you'll hear that constantly uh, referred to. Uh, WMATA is, is uh, uh, the metro, uh, easier to uh, understand it in that, that sense. Uh, let me ask, uh, Ms. Jeter, you, you're in a unique position, uh, I, I think. And uh, I, I know we were introduced previously by Steve McDougall, who's the, the president of Local 589 in the Boston area, That's and correct. we've had situations on the T in Boston with uh, train collisions. Yes. Now, uh, I, understand, I understand where we are uh, on, on the metro, and I'm a rider as well. I'm, I'm a commuter. I don't have a car down here, so uh, I find myself on, on the metro quite a bit. But uh, there, there are two systems, and one is to have a, a manual operating system where the conductor actually operates the train manually, and then there's a, an automated system that is, is used. As I understand the circumstances uh, of the most recent accident, uh, train 214, which was uh, uh, the, the first train in line, uh, was being operated manually by that conductor, mm -hmm. while the one that uh, Ms. McMillan was operating uh, hers was on automatic, yes. and uh, the way it should have worked was that uh, Ms. McWilliams' train 112 should have detected uh, the train in front of her and should have automatically stopped the train or slowed it down. And uh, as I understand it, she visually made a report that there was a train ahead and that uh, so all the indications were that she recognized the threat, but that mechanically the system did not work and it failed. Where you have this seeming conflict, and I'm not sure why the first train was manually operated. Maybe that was a decision by the, the conductor in that case. I understand those signals weren't operating in that area, uh, or they were operating inter intermittently in that area. It may have been a decision on the part of the conductor just to, to switch to manual operation. I'm not sure. But uh, where you have this conflict, is there a way to safely resolve that? Uh, or what, what are your own observations, having been in the seat uh, yourself and uh, being very, very familiar with the circumstances for your conductors, for your employees? Uh, how, how best might we resolve that, that conflict between going between manual operation and automatic operation? Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I think that, first of all, let me say that under no circumstances, whether the train was in manual or in ATO, should it have happened, safeguards are in place to protect uh, that kind of accident from occurring, whether you are in manual or in automatic. Um, I think that the operators are trained to um, know when it's best for them to um, move up in a manual or switch from automatic to manual. And also from my experience and history as being an operator, I've also seen where all you should have to do is let Central know that you've encountered a problem. And once you've let them know that you've encountered the problem, they know that um, manual operation is needed. Um, I believe in the system. I believe in it wholeheartedly. I, like you, you know, believe that it is a safe system, uh, although it should be safer at this point. But I do know that um, under no, and I hope I answered your question, because under no circumstances should it, it have occurred, period. I uh, thank you. And I now yield uh, to the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz, from Utah for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Congressman Davis, if you could expand a little bit about the uh, kind of a two-part question. 
about the funding itself, what would happen if the funding were not to go forward from your perspective in history? And then the second part of that question is, is the funding alone going to solve the problem? Or are there other challenges that you see above and beyond just the funding, uh, lack of funding? If you know, money doesn't always solve problems by itself. That's why we put the independent IG into this legislation and federal representation. We thought all of these would enhance oversight over the system to help it being spent you know, uh, correctly along the way. Um, the history of this is it came under the old District of Columbia Committee. All, every other transit system in the country came under the Transportation Committee, uh, Transportation Infrastructure, T&I. But this came under the old D.C. Committee. This goes back to the days of President Eisenhower. And so when we were putting together transportation bills, you know, whether it was T. Lou or whatever the imagination was, Metro's funding wasn't included in that. They, there was no grab bag for Metro to get money outside of the annual federal uh, uh, appropriation. So we went a separate route through this committee to get the authorization bill uh, together. But that's one of the reasons I think that money um, was not as forthcoming. Of course, secondly, although the, the uh, Metro system operates in three different jurisdictions, D.C., uh, Maryland, uh, and Virginia, when it comes to transportation funding, it's a, grand ba it's a grab bag. And whether it was under the Federal Transit Administration or UMTA, its precursors, um, you really didn't, uh, our money coming from there, we we're not able to get it in the same way because we weren't on the same list. We operated independently and separate. That's why Metro needed its own um, uh, 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 funding uh, legislation that we put forward. So w but the consequence, if the funding doesn't happen, I mean, it wasn't in the president's first budget. I if these things don't come to fruition, what do you see? Have to yeah, there's a $6 billion documented need. Our legislation addresses $3 billion of it, which is half federal and half local dedicated revenue, which they never had before. Under the president's budget, uh, there would have been nothing in there uh, originally. And uh, that's why we were grateful that the House put it in. And then nothing proceeds. And by the way, if the federal government doesn't put their $150 million in, the local jurisdictions may decide not to. So it's almost a $300 million hit. But it looks like it's on its way. Uh, Ms. Jeter, let me, let me ask you real quickly in the brief moments that I have here. Um, as our chairman was talking about the manual versus automatic, can, can you talk a little bit about sort of the morale and things that you're seeing happening now? Because I really get concerned that when we have federal – uh, employees and, and the public at large traveling here. I mean, obviously, any any crash is devastating. Uh, you were quoted as saying, quote, we haven't received anything that would make us think this was an isolated incident. I do need to know that that this is not going to happen again. I do have people out there who are afraid, end quote. Yes. You know, as as operators report to work every day, I think the main thing to remember is that we are trained to be for professionals, but your own basic need for survival and your instincts kick in, you know, at some point. And because early on in the investigation we had received information from different operators that there had been other instances where uh, even though a crash had not taken place, that their train did not respond to the commands or the, or the wayside equipment, equipment did not command the train as it should have. And so for that reason, yes, we do have employees that are um, apprehensive about whether or not this will occur again. Um, but I do believe that as professional as we all try to be in our occupations and as we report to our jobs, um, the operators will continue to work. Those who would like to go back to the bus and maybe don't have the stomach anymore for operating a train, I'm sure that uh, Mr. Kubitschek will make sure that they have the opportunity to do so. And, and real quickly, I have only seconds left here, but maybe if each of the three of you uh, uh, could just address, what's the number one thing you'd like to see us do? Well, certainly, uh, as Mr. Micah said, getting good funding in place uh, for safety, getting a long-term transportation bill uh, with sufficient resources so not only WMATA but transit systems across the country can address their fundamental needs is critical. Thank you. Sorry, my time's short, Ms. Jeter. I think the funding is essential. No matter what you talk about, whether you talk about training, whether you talk about enhanced technology, you need dollars. 
no matter what. Yeah, uh, two things. First, adopt the Metro Compact amendments. The, the federal government has not adopted their share. That, that I think that enhances the annual funding, $150 million, which is put in. And secondly, I think we ought to take a shot at some of the stimulus money and bring it right here to correct these problems right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to recognize that Mr. Tua has, ag has agreed to join us now. Uh, let me just do a brief uh, introduction, and then I'm going to have to swear Mr. Tewitt so that he can respond to questions. Uh, Mr. Patrick Tewitt is currently the Associate Chair and Head of the Masters of Arts Program in Theater and History at, uh, and Criticism at the Catholic University of America. He has also taught at the University of Notre Dame and the Ohio State University. At the time of this accident, relevant to this hearing, Mr. Tewitt was in the front of the second car of the train, uh, train 112, the one that actually came forward and, and struck 214, and he helped people exit the train after the collision occurred. Uh, Mr. Tewitt, it is the custom of this committee to have witnesses sworn who are prepared to provide testimony. Could I ask you to stand and raise your right hand? Uh, Mr. Tewitt, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record show that Mr. Tewitt has answered in the affirmative, and I will now yield I will yield five minutes to the gentleman from Northern Virginia, Mr. Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me ask uh, my, my predecessor, Mr. Davis, um, if we don't amend the compact uh, for Metro, uh, is the federal money tied up until we do? Now, my understanding is it's not tied up. One of the reasons the administration didn't fund it is because under the law, without the compact being amended, they weren't obligated to fund it. But I think this just puts it in motion, and it makes it a lot easier to get money in the out years. $150 million in this environment is, is, is tough. With respect to my colleague Mr. Chaffetz's question, is it not true that uh, Metro has either the highest fare box recovery rate or the second highest in the United States? Do you know? Um, I Second highest. Second highest. So, so the users are, in fact, certainly paying their fair share. I think they are, as somebody who uses it. I... And, uh, and until recently, well, until this legislation, most of the financial burden in terms of subsidies has fallen on the state of Maryland, the District of Columbia, and the localities in Virginia. Is that not correct? Uh, that is correct. That's where the subsidies have come from, right out of local and state budgets. Is there any other subway system in America? that bears the brunt of almost 15 million visitors from all around the country, indeed all around the world, uh, other than the metro system and metropolitan Yeah, Washington. I mean, New York may. I don't know the answer, but New York has a state funding mechanism and a completely different mechanism. It was built at a different time, different era. And isn't it true, Congressman Davis, that, uh, that uh, perhaps the largest single beneficiary daily of the metro system being here is, in fact, the federal government moving its federal workforce? It's uh, federal government moving its workers. It's tourists who come here to visit their nation's capital. You know, we're not, the Moscow subway system is an elaborate system, and they didn't chintz on it. I mean, they funded it. This was a statement of what their government, what they wanted the world to see their government. Unfortunately, I don't think it's been the same here. I, I think that's really a good point. This is the nation's capital. It's arguably been called the capital of the free world, and the federal government has some responsibility beyond the initial construction costs of trying to help make sure that system remains health, healthy and safe uh, and indeed hopefully can be expanded in the, what is after all a non-attainment region in terms of air quality with by some measurements the second worst congestion in the United States. Yeah, and that was President Eisenhower's vision that this would be the nation's subway system that it wouldn't just be another local subway system competing with all the other local subway systems. Um, Ms. Jeter, uh, you were being asked about uh, previous statements you made about the nervousness of the workforce and of course I do think it's important to put in perspective the tragedy notwithstanding uh, in the 33 years of operation of the metro system it has functioned on a daily basis as one of the safest transit systems in the United States is that not correct? That is correct. And as a matter of fact I think we've had a total of three accidents major accidents in the history of the system is that not correct? That's correct, but I'd also like to add, Mr. Conley, that even though we have not had those types of accidents, as a, a rail operator, I know that when an accident occurs, 
it occurs. Absolutely. And, and one of the things that occurred, Ms. Jeter uh, and Mr. Millar, you may want to comment as well, was, uh, was because we were having thought what's called Series 1000 cars, some, some of the very earliest cars in the system, uh, in the front of the, of, of the train that crashed into the stationary, uh, the stationary train. Is that correct? Yes. And the Series 1000 cars are, in terms of crashworthiness and safe haven for passengers, a lot less safe and reliable than more recently constructed cars. Is that correct? They are the weaker built cars. And is it also true to your knowledge that there is no federal standard in terms of crashworthiness and safety of passengers on transit systems? There is for rail systems like uh, Amtrak, but there is not for transit. And, and my time's up, but perhaps you'd like to comment on that before. Not that I know of. Uh, what there is is the federally endorsed voluntary standard system, crashworthiness, that I describe in my testimony that's been developed. Obviously, older cars were built under the practices of the time. As newer cars are built and purchased, they will be uh, bought, presumably, to the standards of that time, and cars that are bought 10 years from now will have to their standards. So, continuously moving and improving target over time. Mr. Chairman, my time is up, but this is an issue that has come out of our, the regional delegation's examination of the tragedy of June 22nd, this anomaly in federal regulation where we do regulate for hard rail cars on railroad systems, but not for transit. It's a voluntary system of safety, and we may, this committee may want to take a fresh look at that. I thank the chair. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I'd now like to uh, recognize the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Ms. Holmes Norton, who has been a driving force along with Mr. Cummings and Mr. Connolly uh, on this issue. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Now, Mr. Miller, your, your testimony is replete with standards. I mean, they're the kind of standards that I think the public thought <laughs> applied. Um, indeed were required, I think most people would have thought. Uh, they uh, almost encyclopedic. Uh, first, I want to know who has adopted these standards. Yes. And then I want to ask you why you believe the federal government has done no more than give you mm -hmm. a, uh, you, uh, a, um, charge to develop standards while apparently not giving anyone the charge to enforce standards. Yes. Uh, standards are developed under uh, federal law that allow for industry developed standards. The development of our standards has been funded both by our own members as well as the Federal Transit Administration when it comes to rail transit and bus transit standards. When it comes to commuter rail standards, those have also been funded uh, or uh, have been uh, worked on by the Federal Railroad Administration uh, as well. Uh, it is up to each transit property themselves to adopt standards. So what is the usual practice? When you develop standards, have you found that uh, transit systems across the United States readily develop these standards and did WMATA do so? Yes, we have found that once the standards are developed and agreed to, they're called consensus standards uh, because there is agreement that this is the right standard, and then we find transit uh, systems do, in fact, use those standards uh, because they want to improve safety, uh, and the standards do that. As they are common, WMATA they are common a, carriers, and, of course, uh, in our law, you'd expect them to want to improve and to do so. Let me ask Mr. Davis, uh, who knows so much about the system, and it, and began us uh, uh, in this process. Uh, uh, you've heard the testimony here that we, we, we have a long list of standards. Do you believe the time has come, Mr. Davis, to for the Federal Transit Administration or some agency of the federal government uh, to, in fact, enforce some at least minimal standards for safety of passengers in transit systems uh, throughout the United States? Sure. But let me note one other thing. Um, there is, to my knowledge, no identifiable grant source to buy rail cars outside of the New Starts program. 
So when you start talking about our ability to buy rail cars and the like, it's got to come comes right out of Metro's high. They they can't go to the federal government for that. Isn't that right? Uh, do you think that are you are you implying that the federal government does not have the authority on the Interstate Commerce Clause to require minimal standards? No, I think they have the authority. Uh, let me let me um, um, ask um, ask Miss Jeter. Miss Jeter, you, you talk about people aging out. No, these are un union jobs, which, as far as I know, are high-paid union jobs. Yes. Uh, may I offer again my condolences to you and to the excellent workforce at WMATA. Congratulate you, especially for what you did during the inauguration. You were way beyond the call of duty then. Thank you. Uh, but but uh, um, here you, you talk about, about operators aging out. Um, the operator who sacrificed her life, worked her way up the ladder, uh, how, is, is, is there some difficulty in attracting people to these highly paid union jobs? I think there is, oh, there is to a certain point. Um, let me say this. WMATA, um, the union, we have right now the majority of the 7,900 uh, so employees, the majority of them have less than 10 years of service. So you have relatively, a, a relatively young workforce, young in the, in the amount of time that they have been on the property. Um, I think that where transportation is concerned, it is, um, although it is a very well-paid position, it can be something that some of us don't uh, enjoy doing. Uh, as a person who has been employed by WMATA for 30 years, there are many Christmases and Thanksgivings that I did not spend with my family. There were plenty of PTA but, meetings. But are they, is there a workforce ready and willing to step up as the workforce ages out? I, I think that there have been some changes that have been made. I know uh, as soon as Mr. Cato got on board, probably about six months after him and I both um, I became president and he became the general manager. We had a conversation about bringing people in full-time versus part-time so that they would be willing to step into um, regular positions. I don't think that WMATA has any trouble recruiting. I think that transportation, because of its stringent rules and regulations, have trouble um, staying. Uh, to be honest. I see my time is, is up. I, I hope we have a second round, Mr. Chairman. Chair now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Thank you very, <coughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank all of you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Um, Millar, when I was uh, looking at the, uh, the Washington Post this morning, they were talking about the NTSB yes, and their uh, letter that they apparently uh, sent to, to you all within the last few days and uh, your immediate response, which I thought was good. And I was just wondering, is the level of automation on the operation of the Ramada system unusual compared to other systems? Uh, I would say uh, yes. I would say uh, that at the time that it was designed, uh, only the BART system in California really had comparable uh, and WMATA really even went a step further. On the other hand, around the world, uh, newer systems now uh, have much more advanced systems. So mm -hmm. at the time, absolutely. Today, not so much. And in your opinion, what are the uh, particular risks that will come with relying on such a high level of, of automation? Well, you have to make sure of the proper design of the automation. You certainly have to make sure of the uh, proper maintenance uh, of the automation. You have to be very careful that when any changes are made, for example, if a new technology fix is intended to be brought in, that there aren't unintended consequences. You certainly have to make sure that the employees are well trained and well familiar with both how to maintain and how to use the service. You also have to make sure that uh, you don't expect it to deliver more than it can deliver. So there, are, you always have to use your technology appropriately. This is no different. And how do you how do you make sure that the things that you just said are done? I mean, one of the things that um, 
you know, the other day, I went to uh, get my brakes fixed. <laughs> and uh, when I got in my car, my literally, literally, my foot went down to the metal. Yeah. And, the, and the car wasn't stopping. <laughs> I won't name the agent, the, uh, the uh, company. But the reason why I mention that is that I think that when you have automation, um, certainly it takes human beings to make sure that all of that stuff works. And I'm just trying to figure out how do you make sure that you've got everything, you know, like it seems like if, when you're depending upon a train to, to stop or to do certain things and it could result as here in the loss of life and significant injuries, how do you make sure that you, I guess, have layers of of uh, compliance and making sure that people do what they're supposed to do. And I'm not saying they don't. I'm just A yeah. couple, couple of ways I would answer your question. First, uh, each transit agency in America is a public agency. Uh, it has its own procedures. It has its own adopted processes. It has its own responsibility to train its employees into the, in those processes. Uh, more recently, over the last few years, APTA, in cooperation with FTA and others, has been developing standard operating procedures and maintenance procedures that can be used. You gave the example of brakes on your cars. That's one of the very early areas that we develop standards in so that employees uh, can have a standard to work against. We also now have a certification program in our industry. I believe WMATA participates in that certification program. So the men and women can know what the standards are, know what the procedures are, be trained in those, tested in those to make sure that, that, uh, that they are well qualified to work. So those are usually the, the general ways that these things are handled. And in response to two WMATA accidents in 2006, the NTSB determined that the lack of an aggressive program of rule compliance testing and enforcement on WMATA system contributed to both 2006 WMATA accidents. And how does WMATA rule compliance testing measure up to other systems? Uh, we have worked with WMATA and other transit systems uh, in this particular area. Recently, WMATA has been particularly placing emphasis on safety uh, and compliance with safety. And again, I believe when the WMATA uh, uh, folks testify later in this hearing, uh, they could tell you much more about that than I'm capable of relating to you. Uh, if there is a follow-up question after that, I would be happy to supply it to you and for the record as the committee might desire. Ms. Jeter, is, I heard the last few seconds of your testimony and, I mean, when your answer to a question, one of the things that you said is that they need the resources. I think you were talking about funding. I, I caught the answer on it. How confident did you feel, did, do you feel that if the money were there, that it would be used for the, 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 the right things? I feel, I feel relatively confident. I also think that along with funding, you also have to have regulations sure. and you have to have those, those criteria in place where they're supposed to do it. Um, one of the things that in, in your questioning you were talking about um, the training that people would have to have in order to do all of this. Funding provides the money for the training, but I also think that we have to stop paying lip service and actually doing it. If, if it's necessary to train the entire fleet of employees in a particular um, new technology, then all of them need to be trained, not just part of them today and then six months later we get to the other part. By the time we get to the other part, six months later, a number of things have occurred. So I think that's some of what we have to do. Um, as an employee, I've watched where, you know, 25 people go to training for one particular thing and then we don't see that training anymore. We move on to the next thing. Um, we have to stop doing that. I think we as transit has to stop doing that to ensure that all employees are trained on particular things, all things that uh, concern any part of transit. I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. 
The chair now is pleased to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bray, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I apologize to the committee because I'd like to get into the weeds. You know, once a transit operator, always a transit operator. Um, and I guess the question will be technically, but also f from the union's point of view. One of the things that was developed in the early 70s and late 60s was this concept that automation was the thing of the future. It wasn't until late in the 70s we started seeing that you've got, you still have to have somebody in the cab. Now, my question is this. As I remember in 78 when we were building our LRT system in San Diego, we were told by BART, we were told by Edmonton, we were told quietly out of D.C., was that the system of having automated operation with a manual override, which is basically what we have now, right, mm -hmm. was not the way to go. Has anybody uh, that the fact is the opposite should be the way to go, have manual operation and um, an animated override? Now, there may be the issue of proximity of trains and everything else in this, but what we were told when we were talking to the people in the front line was that the fatigue of an operator was more when they were not operating the car itself, was sitting and basically just keeping an eye on the machine than to physically operate the system. Has anybody done a study on the, re the reaction time of somebody who is not actually operating the vehicle as opposed to somebody who is actually physically doing the operation? Go ahead. I'm not familiar with that particular, if there is such a study. I can tell you the question you've posed uh, is an unresolved question. There are transit systems built today in the world that are fully automatic, no manual override whatsoever. There are transit systems in the world that have some uh, automatic train control features, uh, but much more heavily reliance uh, on the operator. What there is clear agreement is that having uh, automatic train protection systems, uh, such as was included uh, earlier testimony today about the uh, in the Rail Safety Act last fall, uh, there's no disagreement about that. That needs to be done and, and is being done around the world. Uh, but I'm not familiar with such a study. I will check our records, and if I find such a study, I'll be glad to make it available to you, sir. Ma'am, from the labor point of view? I, I believe that running a system automatic is the right system to run in. Uh, n when you talk about um, delays that can occur, the train just runs smoother as, as a whole. Um, I think that having a human being there stops whatever from occurring, you know, whatever problems you might have with the, with the system from occurring, and the operator can override and put it in manual. But I do believe I do believe as an operator that running that system on automatic, we're supposed to have an automatic system. It should be able to run and run sufficiently But see, in that's the theory, and we had the bells and whistles. You basically had the engineers that love to engineer everything and try to engineer the human factor out. But as we were, we were strongly urged after um, BART got in operation, was do not ignore the impact on the human of not doing anything that the mine ends up drifting off, there's a lack of concentration, so the reaction to an emergency is going to be much slower for somebody who's not actually engaged in the operation than somebody who is observing it and then is expected to, to impose on. I think that we've got to be open and frank. I'll give you an example. When you fly a B-2 bomber, they are being flown by the person in the pilot seat, but the computer can override and stop you from doing the wrong things. If we've got technology that's that sophisticated, you know, one of the most sophisticated systems that America's ever developed, operating off that mode, we're operating on a 1970 mode that machines, computers can do it, and it was actually an afterthought that we put people on board as a backup. I'm not so sure that, that we shouldn't be taking the time to look at this, study this, and make sure the assumptions we made early in the 70s is the best assumptions going into the, the next century, because I think we need to legitimately say, we assume that the driver will respond to the crisis in a timely manner as opposed to the other way around. And I just think we should rethink that, because I just tell you personally, as somebody who was building a system back in the late 70s, I still remember being told again and again by drivers that of, watch out for this system, it has this problem. And when the accident happened, Madam Chair, I just literally 
um, you know, thought back to those warnings I kept hearing about that. Go ahead. Can I respond? Uh, you know, because the other part of that is also as operators, when you operate for eight hours manually, you also run the risk of someone getting tired. So I think that it has a dual effect on individuals. You know, from as a seasoned operator, I say when you get tired and you feel yourself um, maybe not paying attention, get up, stand up. You know, do something other than just sit there and uh, be lulled with the movement of the train. You have to um, condition yourself to know that being alert is your job. That's what you're supposed to do. When you're not operating that train in manual, you're supposed to be alert. You're supposed to know what that train is doing at I think all times. Uh, Madam Chair, I appreciate the time. I think it may be time that we want to go back and study the human impact on this. We always are looking at the machines, but I think we've got to integrate the human factor. And that assumptions made 20, 30 years ago may not be um, reality today. And I, I think that we ought to openly and frankly discuss that at night. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Bilbrey. Mr. Tewitt, the chairman uh, promised that on the second round of, of questions, we let you begin because we have not yet heard from your important testimony and I witness, uh, and I witness uh, who was involved in um, this accident. Uh, you have five minutes to summarize your testimony, please. Thank you, Chairman. Or Chairwoman, excuse me. Uh, I uh, could I just say that I have received word, Mr. Davis, that you may have to leave. I want to thank you for the chairman and the committee for taking time to, to follow through on what you began here when you were chair of the full committee. So if you have to leave, you would be excused with thanks and gratitude again. Mr. Tewitt. I want to apologize first for my delay. I knew that I had to be here at 2 o'clock. I live in Kensington, Maryland. I decided for the first time since the accident to take the red line. I left my home at 1237. I did not arrive here at Capitol South until 2.55. Uh, the red line is being held up if I just, be, because of, of the accident, I take it. Yes, mm -hmm. and the elevators weren't operating at Forest Glen and there were a number of other problems that caused that delay. So I apologize, but please appreciate my frustration in even giving you that apology. Um, <clears throat> on the afternoon of the 22nd of June, I was on my way to teach a night class at the Catholic University of America um, I decided that night on a whim to save some gas, park at the Wheaton Metro, and take the red line down. I normally ride in the first car of the train, but on that evening it was hot, I was dressed for work, I decided to stay in front of an air conditioner on the platform at the Wheaton station, and because of that got on the second car of the train and sat on the forwardmost right-hand side facing forward near the forwardmost doors, if that helps at all. Um, while riding the train, <clears throat> I read the paper, as I do in the tunnel, and then as we came out of the tunnel, uh, approaching the Silver Spring station, um, somewhere around Silver Spring or Tacoma, I got a little tired and put down the paper, the operator came on and told us to expect a delay. This was a, a typical announcement. This was nothing unusual, but I could hear the conductor's voice or the operator's voice. She reassured us that we would take a delay, stop in between stations, and then start back up again. So as the train came to a stop somewhere south of Silver Spring or south of Tacoma, I don't remember which, I closed my eyes and relaxed a little bit. The train began to move again while my eyes were closed. I had put the paper down, and then somewhere in there, we got to a normal cruising speed, I'll call it, when I heard a screeching noise, a shuddering feeling came through the car, someone yelled behind me that she believed we had derailed, and then one of the loudest bangs I've ever heard in my life. Everyone in the second car, and there weren't many of us, were thrown from their seats. I hit the seat in front of me. I don't really remember much of that, but I do remember um, being on the floor of the second car with a lot of dust, a lot of smoke, not much in the way of screaming, but all my belongings had been thrown to the front of that car. It's at that point, um, first of all, there was no noise. All the electricity was down. 
You could see the sunlight coming through, but it was very um, difficult to make out what was going on. A gentleman who had been sitting forward of me got to his feet and told everyone in the car we should go. Everyone get out of the car. So people did get up. We moved in an orderly fashion. Again, no screaming. A woman opened the lever, the emergency lever, to get the center doors open. The center doors did not open. I helped by reaching in and sliding one of the doors open to the left, and we proceeded to get people out of that car and onto the rocks below. It was quite a big jump. I mean, it's a good four and a half feet, four feet up to the rocks at that point. So we helped lower people out of the car, and it's only at that point when I paused, looked to my left out of the door, and realized that the first car of the train was actually in the air. We could see, I could see debris on the ground, things thrown from the first car into the fencing. There was at least one man that I saw on the ground, khaki shorts, moving, but he did not look good. He was bleeding profusely from his legs. People were already moving towards him so that the people in my car decided to just exit as quickly as we could, as safely as we could, and then move to the back of the car, or all the way to the back of the train. Um, we helped people off the train. When, there, when everyone was out of our car, I noticed two gentlemen had gotten into the second car and were moving to the doors in the interior of the car. I got back onto the train to assist those two gentlemen. They were attempting to open the interior door that connects the second car to the first car. That door was stuck. Uh, I learned later that this was the car I was in was also a 1000 series car. And what had happened was that the roof of the car had actually dimpled like a soda can. Uh, if you take your Sprite can or something, turn it sideways, imagine it's like a car and just press on the top. That's what happened to that second car. Because the roof was down, the struts that support that roof were also down, that prevented the door in the second car from opening enough for anyone in the first car to exit. We could also, there were two gentlemen with me, we could see as we were trying to remove that door that possibly we could take some ceiling panels down. We did that. That didn't work because the metal struts um, underneath that ceiling panel were stronger. We couldn't rip those out, so the door was stuck. We could hear the people at this point in the first car, and it, and it didn't, it was pretty chaotic. They were screaming. They were upset. I could see through the window there were about four to five people in the rearmost section of the first car. I could not see beyond that, which would be the rearmost doors, the side doors that open. You couldn't see past that because the flooring had crushed accordion-like into that section. So all the handrails, all the seating was askew. We had handrails and posts pointing towards us almost like toothpicks, and then four people, four to five people trapped inside there. Uh, when this one young man on the other side realized that we could not open our door, he told us that he was going to break the glass. So he took his shirt off, wrapped it around his wrist, and started punching the glass. It's at that point that myself and the two other gentlemen moved out of the way to avoid the broken glass. At this time, and this is the first time that a first responder came to us, a WMATA operator, I don't know where from, but obviously not on our train, uh, had come in through the third car into the second car. He had the vest, the walkie-talkie, goatee, and told us that we should just exit that car as quickly as possible, that he would take care of that situation as best he could and that first responders were on, his, on their way. So we moved through the cars themselves. They were empty at that point. The second and third car were empty. We moved into, I believe, the fourth car, jumped from the car, and then just got more people out of the cars as best we could, helped lower them. Again, I did not see a lot of first responders at this point because I had not been to the back of the train itself. I don't know what the time was. I don't know how long this narrative would account for. But... Um, when we got out of the train and were moving people out, someone shouted that they needed doctors and nurses. And that was quite vivid for me because I was lowering a woman 
in scrubs from maybe the fourth or fifth car. She said, I'm a nurse, but I'm hurt. And we said, we need you. And she went to the first car. Um, after that, we pretty much moved everyone to the back of the train. It was very confusing. We saw two, I believe, plainclothes policemen in shorts with safety vests. Don't know who they represented, but they told us to stay away from the third rail, stay group at the back of the train. We had people wandering away from the scene. We had people, four passengers at the very least that I witnessed, who picked up their belongings at the end of the train and simply walked north. They left. And there were not enough first responders to prevent them from leaving. And certainly none of us had our wits about us to say, don't go. We just let them go. Um, the, the firemen who arrived on scene went to the parking lot between the community gardens north of New Hampshire Ave, that New Hampshire Ave bridge, and the job row, I think it's job row printing, that has a parking lot there. They could not get to us because we had fencing between the CSX tracks and the metro tracks. There are four sets of tracks at that point by the New Hampshire Street Bridge. The metro tracks are in the middle. There's fencing there to this day with barbed wire on the top. Firemen can't get to you. The firemen's equipment, their trucks and whatnot, could get on, not get on the tracks. So they had to lug their gear, things like jaws of life, diamond cutting saws, and other equipment on stretchers manually carrying that equipment toward the first car. This is when we start to see people at the back of the train. So we, we just waited. We waited and took care of one another as best we could. Okay. Uh, thank the gentleman. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Holmes Norton, for five minutes. I, I need to get on to, to uh, uh, Mr. Miller and Ms. Jeter, but I must ask you, were you injured, Mr. Tewitt? Mr. Mr. Tewitt, were you injured? No, but... Um, I mean, I, I did add some soreness in my neck and back. Uh, I eventually was triaged along with the other people in the parking lot, and I just stayed. And towards the end of the evening, again, it was very confusing. Some of the first responders told people that, look, if we've got your name and number and we've looked after you, you're free to go, which your, I thought was a Your testimony has is, is, is been really indispensable to this hearing. It's riveting testimony. I'm sure it's going to be helpful to the NTS be as well. Let me, because I have only uh, a short period of time. Uh, Mr. Miller, uh, would you have advised WMATA to do what it now has done, uh, to place the 1,000 series cars in the middle and the more crash-worthy cars at either end? Yes or no? Uh, yes, that seems like a prudent thing to do. Um, do you understand why they would not have done it before? Um, I don't know what information they Let might have possessed in Let me ask you this. Uh, faced with, um, therefore faced with choices uh, that you can um, pull 30% of your fleet that goes back almost 40 years, or put them in the middle, the choice should have been to put them in the middle so that either end would have the most crash-worthy cars. Have you ever recommended anything of that kind in your that is not a type of uh, detailed recommendation we would normally participate in in any way uh, I would caution that what looks like a very good idea given the circumstances that we think we understand now could in a different set of circumstances look like a very and we bad will idea. question uh, we will question yeah. the next panel on, on that miss Jeter um, it's important to hear your testimony about automatic versus manual. You know that some members of the public have been concerned about uh, reports of a metro operator who seemed to be sleeping. I'll tell you one thing, it's easy to go to sleep on any kind of moving vehicle, especially a train. Um, uh, there was concern, and we are so pleased to learn that the operator didn't even have her cell phone with us, yes. so we know she was paying close, uh, close attention. I understand what automatic does, but I really have to ask you, what is there? And shouldn't there be something that the operator has to do fairly often during the trip 
to keep her alert in light of you know human sacrifice human a human instinct to get bored if you're just sitting there doing the same thing over and over again isn't there something well, more we that do. should be done either you or mr miller think might be done to keep people alert well actually we do um the operators are responsible for opening and closing the doors at this point. We are also responsible for giving out announcements. It's our job to listen to the radios and monitor the radios so that we know what is going on on the railroad ahead of us. And so what you really think there is enough to keep people alert already? I do. And, and I, I see you shaking your head, head, Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller, in your testimony, I, I, I note that you say this fundamental system, you, you say the WMATA had adopted the fundamentals of the safety system. Yeah. Uh, also provides safe and effective service in other major cities. You name Boston, Atlanta, Baltimore, Miami, Philadelphia, and San Francisco. Do you believe uh, that the system here is as safe as those systems you have enumerated in your testimony? It's at least as safe. I have full confidence in the metro system here. Um, in reading your testimony, Ms. Ms. Jeter, um, I, I some, sometimes, because I don't understand enough about trains had to try to distinguish between what WMATA could have done and what was too costly to do. And you were generous in saying WMATA didn't have a lot of money to do what really needed to be done. Uh, you, you recommended retrofitting some, right. some of the cars. Given the age of this car and the kind of funds it would take to retrofit, and I suppose I should ask this question to Mr. Miller, 40-year-old cars retrofit them, try to make them crash worthy. Is, was that a real option for WMATA? Either Mr. Miller, and I'm trying to get at least one more question in. Yes or no, do you think that that was a real option? I don't know the facts specifically here, but I agree with the fundamentals of your point uh, that if you're going to be retiring a car soon, you want to do only what's uh, absolutely necessary to keep safety and, and operational efficiency. Uh, we'll have to ask wh wh whether it was worth the investment. Let me ask uh, about uh, your testimony, Ms. Ms. Jeter, about um, carbon monitors. You say that NTSB recommended carbon monitors in, in every WMATA car uh, to give advanced uh, performance data. Now, would that have been costly? And do you believe that WMATA installed uh, what it could that was not excessively costly or that that contraptions like this carbon monitors could have and should have been installed in any case? I think over the years, WMATA probably purchased new cars hoping to alleviate. Sorry, say that again. Per over the years, WMATA purchased new cars hoping to alleviate the problems that had been identified. Um, it would be harsh for me to say that they purposely did not follow. No, but that's not my question. I'm trying to say, to distinguish, you talk about rollback and there's some things that they didn't install. Correct. I'm trying to, con do you think that WMATA, given the, the, the circumstances it faced with Congress not providing the money and, of course, you not, the, the system not having anything like the funds, it did what it could to prevent this uh, accident, assuming that it didn't have the money for, <laughs> for whole new cars or maybe even retrofitting cars. Where this accident is concerned, to be perfectly honest, I think there was some, um, <coughs> there was some, some, there was part of the situation that was missed, either through supervision, um, whether or not it was uh, monitoring that should have taken place after some of the circuitry was changed uh, on the rails. Uh, I think that's a place where we probably need to go back and look at what the procedures are so that we would have the procedures in place. It's my understanding, and I understand we're out of time, but it's my understanding that once that wheezy bomb was changed or once there was uh, a problem identified with that wheezy bond, there should have been certain things done to assure that it was um, operating as it should have been. Uh, and apparently it wasn't, because it's my understanding that train 112 wasn't even seen. So if the train wasn't seen, why? Is, was that a bond that prohibited 
that train from being able to be monitored by either central control or, or some other manual. Thank you, Ms. Jeter. Source. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to recognize uh, uh, the gentleman from Maryland, uh, Mr. Van Hollen, who has been a, a, an active and attentive uh, member on this issue, a member of our, our full committee. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for bringing us together on this very important issue. And I won't use uh, the whole five minutes. I do want to thank uh, our former colleague, Mr. Davis, who had to leave again for his longtime leadership on the question of WMATA. And all of us from this region are very pleased that uh, we were able to get the $150 million appropriation uh, from the subcommittee, the Appropriations Committee subcommittee. And obviously, that's the first step uh, in providing uh, the federal component of the ongoing uh, funding. Uh, to Mr. Tewitt, uh, it's great to have a fellow resident of the town of Kensington uh, with us, and thank you for sharing your story. And thank all of our witnesses. In fact, uh, my colleague, Ms. Norton, uh, asked some of the questions uh, I was going to ask of uh, the other two of you. So in the interest of time, Mr. Chairman, uh, I will just move to the next panel. Thank you. I want to thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we want to thank each of you for your, your testimony here today. Uh, there have been, as, as always, there are a number of other hearings going on at the same time. Also, you, as you know, we've had votes on the floor. I, I will ask uh, that you remain uh, responsive if members who were not here at the hearing today have any questions that they would submit in writing, I would forward them to you, and we would ask that you respond to them within five days. Oh, sure. But with that, yes, uh, I want to thank you for your testimony today, and I bid you a good day. Thank you. Thank you.